Hello, today we're going to do the last section of structure 1.2 on the nuclear atom. Um, this section is a higher level only, um, so this is not covered in the SL curriculum. And we're going to look at mass spectra to determine relative atomic masses of elements from their isotopic uh, composition. So the first step when you're analyzing something for um, mass spectroscopy is you're going to need to make it into an ion. So if you have something like, um, let's just say we're doing chlorine, um, we need to remove an electron from it and turn it into chlorine with a positive charge and the electron will be lost. Um, now chlorine doesn't normally do this, it takes a good bit of energy. This is called ionization or ionization energy to remove an electron. Um, you can also do it for other elements. Um, carbon. You're just, you're just removing an electron. And this is to process it for the, so that it has a positive charge to work in the machine. Um, a lot of times we will be looking at something called the mass to charge ratio and it will look like this, m over z. Um, because of the way that we process a lot of these elements, z will wind up being um, 1, plus 1, because a lot of those elements are going to have a plus 1 charge. So when you have m slash z, most of the time it's going to be equivalent to just the mass. So the reason that we need it to be charged is because of the way the mass spectrometer works. Um, you don't need to know this in a lot of detail, but just the idea that um, they take those ions and they shoot them through the machine and it's curved, all right, like this. And then there's magnets, effectively. Um, so there's negative and positively charged magnets. So one those uh, ions are moving through moving through here they can they're really heavy they won't get deflected very much but if they're very light very lightweight they'll be deflected a lot by this magnet and get pulled closer to it so by the end there's a detector and that detector will kind of separate it based off of the mass and you'll see different peaks different signals based on the number of ions that hit up each different mass and then you'll wind up with something like this. So this is what the machine is reading. And um, how tall the peak is refers to the relative abundance. Um, and that indicates like how many of the ions in the sample have that mass effectively. Um, so we can use this information to figure out the average atomic mass if it's an element. Um, now in this case, we have um, a three to one ratio. So what you can do is you would add those together first. So I have four total. And then I can say that three fourths of my sample comes from isotope 35 or has a mass of 35. Um, and then that means one fourth of my sample has a mass of 37. And when I multiply that, you're going to continue solving this just like any other atomic mass problem and add it together at the end. And so our average atomic mass here is 35.5, and that would indicate that it's the element chlorine. Uh, it's a little off from the actual because you're using mass number instead of, um, you know, the, the actual mass of that particular uh, isotope. Uh, but, but you can you'll always be able to figure out what element it is based off of the graph that they give you. They'll give you like idealized graphs like this. Um, so yeah, you add together, find the total, take the fraction times the mass, and then add together your answers. Okay, so you can also use mass spectroscopy for compounds. Um, we will delve into this a little bit more in detail when we talk about analytical techniques. But um, just kind of a primer here. If you, you always have to make it a positive charged ion. So you'll notice that all of these fragments are positively charged. All right. But I want you to think, so this is CO2, right? CO2. Its total mass is 44. So whichever peak is the largest tall peak, that's your total mass for the compound. 
then you would consider if you break bonds. So if I break this first bond, I would wind up with an oxygen by itself and a C double bond O. The C double bond O would have a mass of 28, which is here, and the oxygen has a mass of 16. Now, if you were to then take that C double bond O and break it up into even smaller pieces, you would have another O with 16 and a carbon, which is 12. So that's where you get this last carbon peak. So you can also do mass spectroscopy for compounds. It will just, you'll have the total mass is the largest one and it will break different bonds in different ways and you'll get all these little fragments. And that's all you kind of need to know right now. It's still going to be the largest peak is going to have the highest intensity and they will be um, relative from there. Uh, but you don't need to calculate like an average like we do for an element. Let's do one more example. Um, so let, let's assume that this is a single element. Um, and first thing you want to do is add up the relative abundances. Uh, so in this case, 9 plus 1 plus 6 is 16. And so 9 sixteenths um, is, has a mass of 70. 6 sixteenths have a mass of 72 and just 1 16th has a mass of 74. And so let's multiply that out. 27 and then 4.625. And then you're gonna add them together. And I get 71 even as my average atomic mass. Um, I don't know what element this is off the top of my head um, or it could just be made up data. Um, but this would be the process for finding the average atomic mass for this sample. You get 71 as your final answer. Okay, and so we have just one linking question for this section, uh, and it links to structure 3.2, which we will get to much later. But um, just in case you're going in a different order, uh, how does the fragmentation pattern of a compound in the mass spectrometer help in the determination of its structure? So um, we kind of talked about this with carbon dioxide, but whatever your compound is, um, you know, well, you typically use this with organic, um, at least in this context. Essentially, you can break the compound down into pieces. So you'll have um, the total mass as one of your peaks in your mass spectra. Then you will, um, you know, have maybe a CH3 and the, this other big piece as another frag, um, two other fragments, and then you might have um, this thing as its own fragment um, if you break more bonds there. So by knowing the size of those different fragments, you, it gives you an idea of where the bonds could be based on like what could cut and become that mass. Um, and we'll do a lot of practices with this when we get to analytical chemistry.